Rome fell. It's obvious to us now that it took the Western world nearly 2,000 years to get over it. During that time, Europe was divided between warring states which all were trying to recreate the Roman Empire. However, there was a point when the two great European states that claimed descent from the Roman Empire nearly united, thus effectively unifying the Christian world. This was in 802, when Princess Irene of Byzantium, or the Eastern Roman Empire, offered her hand in marriage to Charlemagne, Frankish, or Holy Roman Emperor. Irene repealed her request later, and this never came to be. But what if this marriage had gone through? the Byzantine and Frankish empires being unified. A united empire would have formed between the English Channel to Syria and from Sicily to Saxony. What would have happened if that had occurred? How would it have affected the world, civilization, wars, demographics, and culture? That is the question of this alternate history. Before we start, I personally love reading and this show was built off it, but I understand that people have trouble fitting the time into their lives. This is where our sponsor Blinklist comes in. They summarize highly complex books in 15 minutes. I really liked their 15 minute summary of the book Foragers, Fossils, and Fuel, which is a good book about how our value systems throughout history have been determined by our method of capturing energy. Hunter-gatherers, farmers, and industrial societies all have very different value systems since that's what's necessary for the societies to function. See, you could learn the gist of that in 15 minutes rather than sitting down for 10 hours. Again, you can read or listen to these on a morning commute or while exercising since there is offline access. They have a huge library of over 3,000 book summaries. I was pleasantly surprised by how many obscure books I liked which were there. Click the link in the description to check out Blinklist today. The first 100 people who click on this link are going to get unlimited access for one week to try out whatever they want. You'll also get 25% off if you want full membership. This alternate history is pretty easy to start. Irene never reneges her request for marriage and Charlemagne feeling ambitious agrees. Part of what makes this timeline so interesting is that both individuals involved are quite remarkable, and it's fascinating to see how the two of them would have interacted together. We all know Charlemagne, the superhero of Dark Age Europe, leading the Carolingian dynasty and the Frankish Empire to its height, fighting many different impressive wars, ushering in a golden age of culture and scholarship, and becoming the father of France and Germany. He is the ancestor of every European alive today, and was so legendary that in continental Europe, Charlemagne legends competed with King Arthur. In a very different way, Irene was deeply impressive. She was an orphan born in poverty near Athens, and like some folktale, was stunningly beautiful, and was chosen to become the emperor's bride, as some historians think, by winning a beauty pageant. Rather than a fairy tale happy ending, this was followed by her husband dying of a fever several years later followed by her gaining imperial power, followed by an era of unparalleled palace scheming and intrigue. This isn't a Richard III situation, where she's been maligned by later historians, or the biases of sexist historians. She really was that bad. For example, she blinded her young son and threw him out of power when he started to show independence and work with some of her former enemies. She was in a permanent state of reshuffling the ministers and creating new enemies. In fact, she was removed from power by her finance minister, whom she had already alienated by removing him from power before she restored him. It gets even worse when you realize that she was a big pro-icon emperor, and those were the guys who ended up winning. This was an era in which almost all history was written by monks, and so to have pro-icon monks betray her badly is even more shocking. Thus, this would be a very strange marriage. Another thing to consider is that Charlemagne was nearly 60 and Irene was 40. A child isn't out of the question, but unlikely. It's also unclear how personal this relationship would be and how political. Charlemagne would have certainly heard about her reputation, and both monarchs would have their own jobs to do in their own nations. Charlemagne already had three wives by this point, 
The Catholic Church hadn't really convinced the Germanic barbarians that polygamy was bad yet, and also the reasoning could have been a good deal political, with the Byzantine Empire at a low point in the early 9th century, consistently losing to both the Arabs and Bulgars. Irene was likely trying to introduce the growing power of the Frankish Western Empire alongside Charlemagne as a force to give Byzantium power, while also adding a new confusing force into the palace intrigue that was gradually settling into odds that were stacked against her. All things considered, this would be a fascinating relationship. It's the effect of marrying Sigmar from Warhammer with Livia from I, Claudius. I order one of you to write a fanfic about their relationship and make a subreddit writing their dialogue. Maybe a best-selling romance novel is wedged somewhere in there, just give me a third of the royalties for the idea. So, how would this relationship play out? Charlemagne was done with most of his conquests, having effectively pacified Saxony after a bloody 30-year campaign. The northern frontier was stable, and so he could put his energies into dealing with the south and integrating his empire with Byzantium. This would, however, mean that Charlemagne would never have invaded modern Hungary and smashed the powerful Avar confederacy with this precious section of his later life. The Avars were very wealthy and had an impressive set of forts called the Ring, and he completely obliterated them, turning the Hungarian plain into a wasteland. This was a really hard campaign. Without, well, a Charlemagne, it never would have succeeded. The Avars would have survived as the dominant power in the Hungarian plain. This would have meant there never would have been the power vacuum that let the Magyars, or Hungarians, enter and take over the region. If I'm being honest, the Avars and Magyars aren't that different. Genetics show that the vast majority of Hungarians are genetically Slavic, with both groups being tiny ruling elites. Both the Avars and Magyars were nomadic horse tribes, with the Avars having settled down 200 years earlier into a more stable farming state. In this timeline, there never would have been the large Magyar raids into Central Europe if there were in our timeline in the 9th and 10th centuries. Charlemagne would make quite the impression in the Byzantine Empire. Irene's ministers did not trust her, and likely backstab her for Charlemagne. Charlemagne would be far away for more of the time managing his northern empire, and would thus let the Byzantine bureaucrats do more of what they wanted. Also, the Byzantines understood, or at least thought they understood barbarians pretty well. The Byzantines had assimilated barbarian empires for sport, integrating Slavic, Macedonian, Armenian, and Anatolian emperors from the fringe into Byzantine society. Irene would still get murdered by Byzantine factions, and Charlemagne would become Byzantine Emperor, marrying some Greek girl and trying to produce an heir. Considering that he was still in fertile age and had multiple sons in our timeline, he'd likely be successful. Charlemagne, for psychological and geographic reasons, would place his capital at Rome to manage the empire. Being very old at this point, Charlemagne would die. Something critical that people always forget when they try to make this alternate history is Frankish succession laws. Under Frankish law, kingdoms were divided between the sons, which is why after Charlemagne's death, the empire was divided between Germany, France, and Lotharingia. This wasn't true of the Byzantine Empire, but the idea that Byzantine succession laws would apply in the western part of the empire, in which the Byzantines would have practically no influence and which was run by a proud warrior nobility that would probably kill whatever Greek bureaucrat would try to tell them what to do, seems silly. The chances would be higher if the division of power inside the empire was more even, but with Irene gone, it seems unlikely. The division of the empire would happen something like this. The hypothetical half-Greek son would get much of the old Byzantine section of the empire. He'd be a child to the chances that some palace intrigue, in classic Byzantine fashion, would take over and actually manage the empire, if not just kill him, are pretty high. The rest of the empire would be divided between Charlemagne's three older sons. Italy would be unified between the Byzantine and Frankish parts of the empire, and with it being a center of the empire and with Rome as the capital. The papal states might theoretically survive on paper, but with the king based out of Rome in the middle of Italy, their actual power would be pretty weak. With the entirety of Italy going to one son, the other two would divide Europe north of the Alps. This really wouldn't change a lot, since one of the first things that happened in our timeline after Charlemagne's death was France and Germany partitioning Lotharingia, which is why there isn't a huge country between France and Germany called Lotharingia anymore. 
The real meaningful long-term effect of this timeline is that Italy becomes a unified kingdom rather than a mess of different states. In our timeline, city-states came to dominate the northern half of Italy since, in the collapse of central power after the disintegration of the Frankish Empire, the towns were the main, meaningful authority left since Italy had never seen the economic collapse that happened to most of Western Europe after the fall of Rome. These cities, by being run by the local town merchants and spurred on by competition between each other, were able to produce the masterpiece that was the Renaissance in art and culture. This would never have occurred in this timeline. Instead, with the powerful Frankish central monarchy, northern Italy would be settled with Frankish nobility. Italian would have a lot more Germanic words, and Italy in general would be much more like France. Call me cynical and jaded, but I don't think the Renaissance is that important to humanity's progress. The art that came out of it was spectacular, don't get me wrong, but the big things that revolutionized Europe in that era were not related or barely related. Whether it be the Reformation, Age of Exploration, or Scientific Revolution, which, if we're being real, could just be considered a side effect of the Military Revolution, all of which occurred primarily outside of Italy, with barely anything coming from the Renaissance. Similarly, with the Pope under the Italian king's thumb, the Catholic Church and Western civilization would have taken a very different direction. One of the defining features of Western civilization, as mentioned in the previous video, is a separation of religious and political authority, which only really exists in the West. A lot of this happened due to the papacy and the lay authorities being at odds. Similarly, with the Pope a tool of the King of Italy, the rest of the Christian world would have ignored him. The French, English, and German bishops would have just kept to themselves and each nation's church would evolve in its own direction. Christianity would be a much more decentralized religion, similar to how Islam is in our world. Being a unified country in Western Europe in control of the wealthy North Italian plain would mean that Italy would be a great European power in this timeline, on par with Spain, France, or England. Yeah, a lot of you are probably disappointed in this video. I'm betting most of you clicked on this with the assumption that the Byzantine Frankish Empire would have been some badass Christian empire that would have taken over the world. I also wanted to make that video, but the more research I did, the more I realized that it was just unrealistic. The truth is that empires that are geographically, culturally, and systemically very different can't unify just by a marriage. I guess a good example would be the Jagiellian monarchs who were dynastically able to unify Poland, Hungary, Lithuania, and Bohemia for much of the 15th century, controlling a third of Europe. The state was so divided by every metric that nothing was really achieved, and so it actually hurt some of the countries involved since the monarch was so far away and couldn't manage the throne. We're in a similar situation with this timeline. What if altist, and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please like, comment, subscribe, or stay tuned for more content. Or alternatively, check out my Patreon, which has got the first several chapters of my History of the World alongside all sorts of cool maps. Or check out my Twitter to stay tuned for more stuff. As always, thank you very much and have a great day.